Hi, Rob. Can you hear me? Oh, okay. So it's 12 o'clock, so let's start. Uh, okay. So thank you for attending the talk. My name is Fan, and I'm a second year PhD student from Dr. Jelio's lab. Today, I will talk about my current research, which is an accurate and interpretable computational model for predicting nucleosome resolution quantum contact maps. And I'm currently preparing the manuscript for this research, and hopefully it will come out at the end of this month. So during my presentation, you can ask questions at any time. You can just leave a comment in the chat box, and I will try to answer the questions during my presentation. So first, let's talk about some background. We are familiar that gene transcription is a key step of genetic information flow within biological systems. It requires the collaboration of uh, enhancers, promoters, and a lot of uh, DNA, uh, a, lot of, a lot of binding proteins, namely transcriptional factors. And there's a lot of evidence showing that the initialization of gene transcription is related to the direct communication of enhancers and uh, promoters in 3D space. They might directly contact with each other like this, or with the help of other transcriptional factors like CDCF or cohesin. And a recently published ABC model even showed that a gene should, uh, uh, an element's effect on a gene should depend on both its enhancer activity and uh, its uh, contact frequency with a gene in 3D space. To sum up, gene transcription is not only regulated by the properties of the regulatory element, but also regulated by 3D chromatin structures. Therefore, people are paying more and more attention to 3D chromatin structures, which also requires technologies for capturing accurate chromatin conformation. There are two types of technology. The first type is imaging technologies, including like FISH, DOM, or Chrome EMT. But today, we'll only focus on the ligation-based omics technologies because uh, they are also the most common and can efficiently capture 3D structure at a genome-wide scale. So in case that some of you are unfamiliar with technologies like hi -C, I will briefly go through the workflow of the ligation-based method. So at first, the DNA is cross-linked with formaldehyde. So if fragment, fragment A and fragment B is close in 3D space, they are likely to be cross-linked. Then this cross-linked DNA will be cut with restriction enzyme and labeled, then ligated. Then the hybrid sequence will be cut again and sequenced with paired and sequencing technology and aligned to the reference genome. So if we find that this part comes from fragment A and this part comes from fragment B, we can conclude that fragment A and B are close in 3D space. So with high throughput sequencing, we can obtain millions to billions of contact pairs like this. Uh, which is called high C technology. And this result are uh, visualized in contact maps. For example, if a, if there is a dot here in the contact maps, it indicates that position A and position B has a have a in contact. And darker colors means more contacts are detected between. For example, for this part, darker colors means more contacts are detected between these two loci. So during the past decades, IC technology has already helped us uncover the 3D chromatin structures at hierarchical levels. The first level is called AB compartments. So if we check the contact maps of one chromosome, we may notice some plate structure like this. It indicates that the chromosome, the entire, entire chromosome can be split into two parts. We call it two compartments, A and B. And A tends to interact with A like this, and B tends to interact with B. That will result in the plate patterns in the contact maps. This is this is at a megabase scale. Then, if we zoom in the contact map a little bit, 
to hundreds of kilobases to several megabases level, uh, we'll, uh, we'll find the more squares along the diagonal. It indicates that the loci inside the square, like this, only tends to interact within the uh, with the loci within the same square. Uh, that is called topological associated domains or TADs. It is believed that at most times TADs are the boundaries of transcriptional regulation. One evidence is that when we change the distance between SHH gene and its regulatory element within a TAD, we only observe little effect on gene expression. But if we disrupt the TAD structure, we'll observe a total loss of its expression. Then, if we continue zooming in this contact map, for, we'll notice some, we'll find some highlighted dots like this. It's called Crompton loops. Um, this dot indicates that the anchor of the two anchors of this dot are interacting with each other, form a structure like this. This is interaction building the loop, and uh, loop most loops are related with CTCF and cohesion binding. So, although a lot of 3D Crompton structures like this are discovered with high state technology. It is still rarely utilized in analyzing transcriptional regulation. The reason is quite intuitive because the typical lens of regulatory elements like enhancers, promoters, and maybe the binding motifs of transcriptional factors are usually between tens of base pairs to hundreds of base pairs, which we say is at nucleus scale. But even the highest, even the best high state technology can only reach its kilobase resolution or even tens of kilobase resolution. So there is still a big gap between these two scales. The reason is uh, in high state technology, we can only conclude that uh, fragment A and fragment B, these two fragments have contact, but we don't know which part of fragment A and which part of fragment B has contact. So, if fragment A and fragment B are too long, we can only get really like low resolution. However, this challenge can be overcome. Uh, the new technology, microC and DNA, I say, use different enzymes to cut the DNA into shorter fragments, even into mononucleosomes, which will result in a much higher resolution, uh, like a nucleosome resolution. So um, this technology, microC. So microC outperforms high C in detecting short-range interactions. Let's see, this is 10 to the power of four or five. It's like within tens of kilobases or within hundreds of kilobases. This are the high C contact map and microC contact map from the same region. We can notice that the fine scale structures can only be detected by microC technology. And that's why microC can also help us to discover a lot of fine scale structures within like uh, tons of Keller bases. And this technology, uh, and it can finally match the resolution with some regulatory elements like enhancer promoters and TF binding motifs. So that will provide us a great data source for, you know, jointly analyzing with other data sets. This is a typical, uh, micro C contact map and the resolution is 200 base pair. We can notice some even smaller squares, which is called micro tags, and some stripes and loops formed between enhancers and promoters. So this kind of uh, high uh, high resolution contact maps has have a lot of applications. For example. Uh, we can identify TF collaborations because uh, the binding motifs of TFs is only like tens of base pairs long. So it can only be observed by micro C contact maps. And uh, of course, uh, we can also explain EQTLs because EQTLs are uh, the pairs of variants and genes. And uh, we can try to find whether the variants and gene really have a contact between each other. And that's 
uh, like that can help us to interpret the EQTLs. But however, high, high resolution micro C contact maps are only available in a few cell lines. Uh, so that's a question we want to ask. So it's like, can we use computational approaches to enhance the resolution for like many human tissues or many different cell lines? And for especially for those tissues which we don't do not have really high resolution contact map. And if yes, if we can, so what data do we need? Of course, uh, we we, sh we we can use low resolution contact map and try to enhance them. But some fine scale structures can only cannot be detected by low resolution high C technology. So we still need some additional information, some additional high resolution information. For example, a TF chip seek or histone chip seek. So there's really a really large amount of data. The deep learning method might be the best approaches for us to use. But, you know, deep learning methods usually work as black boxes. We know it works, but we don't know why. So we want to ask, with, uh, can we interpret a model as much as we can and try to like find out why this model can make accurate predictions or how it, like, you know, where did the model get the information of this like high resolution fine scale structures? And that's the second part of my research, the interpretation of the models. So this is the two parts, one is enhancing, another is interpret the model. Actually, there are some previous methods trying to enhance the resolution of IC contact maps. The first type of approaches just regard high C contact maps as pure images, enhance them with image super resolution approaches. So some classic method for, deal, for dealing with images like uh, convolution neural networks or generative adversarial networks can be applied to enhance the resolution. They just train with low and high resolution and then the model can enhance uh, low resolution contact maps to you know, high resolution contact maps. The second type of method assume that the contact between two low between two locus A and B can be predicted with the epigenetic marks near locus A and the marks near locus B as well as A B distance. So uh, to sum up it, uh, the second type of approach is said that the contact maps can be predicted with only with uh, with, with, with epigenetic marks like this high C reg and the previous method called high C plus will use this two method as baseline. But there are still some limitations of the previous method. First thing, they are trained with high C data. So they are enhancing low resolution high C to high resolution high C. So, you know, some structures cannot be detected by high C. So there's still a upper limit. Some scale, some fine scale structures can not be predicted by their model. The second thing is none of them use information from both low resolution content maps and epigenetic marks. Actually, the reason is the aggregation of 2D contact maps like this and 1D epigenetic marks actually is quite challenging because we don't know how to properly aggregate them. And that's exactly the model we are going to, or we developed, we use low resolution contact maps and epigenetic features to make predictions of high resolution contact maps. So how did we aggregate the high C contact, the 2D contact maps and 1D epigenetic marks? The answer is that we use graphs to represent high C data. So this is a typical graph structure with four nodes and four edges. Of course, these edges can be weighted then we can use adjacency matrix to denote the graph. For example, this 0.5 correspond to this 0.5, this weight H, uh, this uh, H weight, and uh, correspond to the H between node 2 and node 1. So let's go back to high C technology. Let's go back to high C contact maps. We'll notice that high C contact maps actually is also, a, is also an adjacency matrix. Each node correspond to each contact beam at a given resolution. And the edge between two beams is the contact between these two beams. And the edges are also weighted because uh, 
we detect different number of contacts between different pair of nodes. So after denoting the, after representing the high state contact map as really large graph, let's focus on, probably let's focus on one node, for example, for this node, let's assume this node correspond to this being contact map. And let's say if now we have eight epigenetic marks, a taxic CCF and some keystone uh, modifications. And for this node, for this maybe one KB region, example, we can find out all the signal strengths for this eight epigenetic marks at this at this beam. Like this one, this one, this one, this one. Since we have eight epigenetic marks, we'll get a eight dimensional vectors. We'll get a eight dimension we'll get an eight dimensional vector like this. So in our graph, we have nodes, we have edges, and each node we have an eight-dimensional vectors attached to that node. This is called an attributed graph. So since we can aggregate 2D contact maps and 1D epigenetic marks with the attributed graph, we can use some graph methods like graph convolutional networks to predict our high resolution contact maps. So I will give you a very brief introduction of uh, the graph convolution, convolution networks. Um, so I think most of us are familiar with traditional 2D convolutions, like using a convolutional kernel, or we say a sliding window to slice through the original image or original 2D input. And for example, if the window reaches this pixel, it's like, is aggregating the information from all its eight neighboring pixels, like this. And it's similar for graph convolutional networks. You can assume there's also an evolutional kernel or sliding window in the graph. So if the window reaches, for example, this node, it's also aggregating all the information from its neighboring node, from all its neighboring nodes. It's like the information is diffused, the information is diffusing in the graph. And at every convol graph convolutional layer, the information will diffuse into its neighboring nodes. That's why when we go to this node, the neighboring nodes information will flow into this node. It's like it's aggregating the information from all the neighboring nodes. So that's com graph convolutional layers does. So this is our the structure of our model. First, we, we still have some traditional 1D convolution. For example, if we are focused on this beam, this pixel, the traditional 1D convolution tries to aggregate the information of its neighboring beams along the genomic fiber. So it's just the neighboring nodes, like this side neighboring nodes, this neighbors, trying to aggregate the information from its neighbors. And we also have graph convolutional layers. This graph comes from high C content map. So it's trying to aggregate the uh, information uh, from the nodes which are con connecting with the center node in high C contact maps. For example, if we have a contact here, a contact here, contact have a contact here, we're aggregating the information from this node, this node, and this node. So by combining there's two different type of convolution. We got a hidden representation for each node. And you, we use this kind of, we use this hidden representation to predict our high resolution contact maps. And this model have, this model has total, totally 2.3 million parameters, which is much less than the input dimensions. This is also a way for uh, avoid, for avoiding overfitting. And as we mentioned before, MicroC outperforms high C in detecting short range interaction. So our model only predicts short range interactions within 200 KB. So if, let's say if this is a, if this is a full chromosome, uh, uh, this is a full contact map of one chromosome, we only predict this region. 
short range interactions. Our input is high, our inputs are high C contact maps at 5 kb or 1 kb resolution and epigenetic data from uh, maybe from encode or epigen or, or roadmap. Uh, of course, you can use any epigenetic marks, but to make this model like more universal, like can be applied for more cell lines, we only use the most common eight marks. A toxic CTCF and some histone methylation and histone acetylation. Of course, you can also print model with other optional marks, any marks. And the output will be uh, the predicted contact maps at 200 base pair resolution. And during training, we use micro C as ground truth. So, uh, for validating our model, first we use cross chromosome validation. We split human embolic stem cell chromosomes into training validation and test that. We train the model with a training set and uh, evaluate the model with a test set using high C, uh, using uh, embryonic stem cell micro C as ground truth. So we use a common way to evaluate to evaluate the similarity between contact maps. It is called distance stratified Pearson's correlation. For example, this upper diagonal is a predicted contact map and this lower diagonal is a real contact map. If we want to calculate their similarities, we'll pick up the straightums, the pick up the strata. The first strata will be the diagonal. And the second strata will be the line next to the diagonal and continue like the third one, probably until the 1000th one. And we'll calculate the Pearson's correlation between, for example, between this strata from predicting map and this strata from the real contact map. And we'll calculate the, from the first strata to the, probably one, the 1000th strata. And this is the correlation we get. The blue line is the correlation between our predicted contact maps and real micro C contact map. And the red, uh, the green line and the orange, the yellow lines, the yellow line are two baseline methods, high C rec and high C plus we mentioned before. The red line is a correlation between high C contact maps and micro C contact maps. We can say that our model outperforms both the baselines. Another issue is that uh, high C contact maps of human embryonic stem cells we used before are deeply sequenced with almost 1 billion contacts. But for other tissues or cancer cell lines, we might not have that good high C data. So we want to check what is the minimum sequencing depth for the input of the for the input high C contact maps. So we randomly remove some contacts of the input human embryonic stem cell high C contact maps and try to evaluate the model with also with the correlation coefficient. And we found that when we drop out 99.5% of contacts, we still got somehow good results. But if we drop out 99.9% of contact rates from the original high C contact map, the result will be much worse. So, uh, so we conclude that probably only 0.5% of the contact rate from the original high contact, that's about 8 million contact pairs. The sequencing depth is about 8 million. Uh, this, con this sequencing depth will be enough for a model to make like somehow good predictions. And the more important things, like the more important thing uh, the more uh, the thing more important than getting high correlation coefficient is that we want to make sure that our model can capture the fine scale structures which cannot be detected by high C technology. And here are some examples. This part is a input high C contact map, and the upper diagonal is a real micro C contact map, and the lower diagonal is our prediction result. And this uh, input some of the input epigenetic marks. And we can see some fine scale structures like loops, short range loops, like this kind of polycom regions, like this kind of anchor center stripe can only be detected by micro C contact maps. But our predicted contact maps can capture and predict this kind of fine scale structures quite well. 
That also proves that our model can predict fine scale structures. Now let's go to some details. The first type of fine scale structures we are talking about is are loops. Uh, we okay. had a question. Uh, we had a question. Yeah. Um, what causes the peaks and valleys of HIC plus predictions at those resolutions? Uh, I'm sorry. I, I... Um, it, it is uh, what causes the peaks and valleys of high C plus predictions at those resolutions? Oh, I see. I see plus. Um, well, that's a really good question. Actually, I'm still very confusing, but I'm also a little confused by this uh, because. I C plus only use convolutional neural networks, so it's training a universal convolutional kernel. It's uh, uh, this method trains some universal, I mean, no, sorry, trains some convolutional kernels to enhance the resolution. And this kernel will slice through the full contact maps. It will not, like, the kernel is the same in. Uh, Okay, thank you for the question. I think probably I'm not very clear about this. Can we like talk offline about this? Because I also need sure. to check the data, like why this got some peaks and valleys here. But I assume that high C plus only means some universal kernels for the full content map. It will not like distinguish diagonal regions and the regions far from diagonal. So that will cause a high C plus maybe that's a reason why high plus is not like a good predicting method like that. Okay. So let's continue to the loops. So as we mentioned before, this kind of highlighted dots are loops. First, we identify all the loops from micro C contact maps and you, we use that as ground truth. Then we pick up all the regions like which supposed to have a loop from both our imputed contact maps and the original high contact maps. Then we pile up all the regions we collected. This is called pile up analysis, which is quite common in analyzing some typical structures in high C contact maps. And we noted that in our imputed contact maps, this region, the contacts are much more enriched in loop regions which indicate that our model can successfully enhance the loop regions and make accurate predictions for loops. And here are another two fine scale structures. The first one is, uh, the first ones are stripes. Stripes are this kind of horizontal or vertical lines anchored and the diagonal is really related to this kind of one-sided extrusion. And we, um, We call stripes at 1 KB resolution by uh, checking the horizontal and vertical lines, which are significantly darker than its neighbors. And finally, our imputed contact map captures 75% or 71% of stripes micro C contact maps, while high C contact maps only capture 5%. And the third type of structure, TADS, because hmm, uh, an important method for calling tests is to calculate the calculate the insul insulation scores. Uh, to calculate the insulation score, we use a square a square window to slide through the diagonal, and we calculate the summation of all the contacts within a square at each step at each step. So, if the square reaches a boundary, reaches a boundary between two ads, you will got a minimum value because there are really fewer contacts than probably than this window. But there's still some debate about like whether tads overlaps, whether tads are continuous. And because we are doing fine scale structures, our windows are much smaller because we want to capture some 
smaller tests like micro tests, people even don't know whether smaller tests like whether they are continuous or whether they ex is it exist everywhere or they only exist in some positions. So to avoid this kind of debate, we directly use uh, um, as uh, the the correlations the correlation between iso as as insulation scores. So the insulation score between micros and our imputed map is 0.924, and the correlation between micros and high C is 0 0.705. So our so to which means our model can give accurate predictions of type boundaries and type distributions. And of course, our ultimate goal is to predict the contact maps for many cell lines and many tissues, which we do not have high resolution micro C contact maps. So we train our model with uh, cell lines, which we have high resolution contact maps and try to impute the contact maps of other human tissues. But now we don't have high resolution micro C contact maps. For like, we don't have a ground truth. So we have to validate our model with some like indirectly validate our model. We used to use some other data set and EQTL will be a great data source. Actually, there are some previous papers concluding that the contacts are enriched between EQTL pairs, like the pairs between the variants and transcriptional start site TSS. Like they say the contacts are enriched between these pairs. But the previous research only use low resolution contact, high C contact maps for human tissues. The resolution is only 40 KB. And if we check the EQTL pairs from GTEx database, we'll notice that half of the pairs, for half of the pairs, the distance, the distances are within 100 KB. It means that in 40 KB resolution contact map, the pairs, the, the, the variant and TSS, they are within the adjacent beans or even at the same beans. So this kind of jointly joint analysis cannot provide results which are reliable enough. But since now we have <clears throat> since now we have we can impute the contact maps at 200 base pair resolution, we are able to check the results at a really high resolution, check the EQTL pairs. Here, we use pancreas as an example. We imputed the contact map of pancreas at 200 base pair resolution. Then we collect pancreas EQTL data from GTEx database and find all the variant TSS pairs. For example, if this is a variant TSS pair, we pick up its connecting regions as well as its some neighboring, some neighboring regions. And for this pairs, for this pair, we pick up this region. Then we pile up all the hundreds of thousands of regions. And this is also kind of pile up analysis. And this is a, this is a result for the pile up analysis. We noted that even at 200 base pair resolution and the regions, the length of this region is only 4 KB. We noted that the EQTL pair, the contacts at the EQTL pairs are still enriched. Mm -hmm. which can bring the joint analysis of high c and EQTL to a new level. But we also need to prove that our imputed contact maps are cell type specific. So it means like if we check pancreas EQTL pairs in pancreas contact maps, so between the pairs, the contacts will be enriched. But if we check pancreas EQTL pairs, in the contact map of another tissue, we should expect the contacts are less enriched, but the contact maps should be different for different tissues, especially for these cell type specific regions. So we also check the pancreas EQTL regions at our predicted contact uh, in our predicted contact maps of human embryonic stem cells. We noted that the center region is less enriched, which proves that our predictions are cell type specific and um, and it matches well with the EQTL pairs. And in the following days, we are going to impute a contact map for more cell lines for about more than 10 human tissues and try to use 
a quantitative method to quantify the enrichment. Now let's go to the last part, the model interpretation with integrated gradient. Because for deep learning, mo for deep learning models, they are basically like black boxes because we know it works, but we don't know it why. Well, but we don't know why. For example, if the model can, if the model say like this image is a reflex camera, but um, uh, we can somehow also try to interpret this conclusion by asking which pixels are the most important reasons for the model to make this kind of decisions. For example, well, this image probably some of the pixels are more important for the more uh, some of the pixels are more important for the model to make this decision. And this is called this kind of this kind of contribution is called attribution. And attribution can be calculated with uh, gradients from the model. And here we use integrated gradient to calculate the attributions for to calculate the attribution to further interpret our model. And here we I don't want to go to much detail about this method. So if you are interested, we can talk offline about this. So this are a typical result. For example, if we are interested in this loop region, we can pick up this region and try to calculate the attribution of this region, which is like asking uh, which epigenetic marks and which regions are the most important for the model to make the decision that there is a loop. And this is a result for this loop. We can notice that CTCF, all oh, the red color means positive attribution and the blue color means a negative attribution. And we notice that CTCF contribute the most to the prediction, which might indicate that this loop is caused by CTCF binding. But some, of course, there might be some other type of loops. For example, this one. This loop, the CDCF is not that important. So probably there's some other mechanism for this loop. And actually the good thing that if you are if you are interested with any region, for example, if you're interested in this line, this stripe, you can pick up the region and ask like which and calculate the attribution for arbitrary region. And we even build a web server for this, but currently we didn't upload the full data because after we imputing the content map for all the tons of like human tissues and other cancer cell lines will also upload to that server. But here um, we also want to support uh, calculating the attributions online in our server. So here are some demo like Let's load the contact map. It's a demo, so probably this is not a final version, but it works like this. For example, we can go to a region and let's see if we are interested in, for example, this stripe. We can drag a square here and we can Of course, uh, uh, but we cannot do real time calculation. For example, if we drag a square, the attribution will be calculated immediately. Uh, we didn't do that because the calculation of the attributes takes some time, maybe tens of seconds. So I don't think uh, supporting real time calculation is like really user friendly. So we can drag a region and submit the job and it's finished. Okay, so then we can load the attributes here. These are attributes from ataxic, CTCF, and all the histone modifications. So some of the here. And the attributions are calculated here. So we can see for these regions we are interested in probably H3, K70, uh, K27 demethylation contributes more. And 
H3K4 tree methylation contributes less like this. So this kind of uh, attributions can be calculated online with our server. And this nucleus, nucleus on browser is developed by a Dr. J. Mas group uh, in Carnegie Mellon University, and we're collaborating with them to publish our results. And uh, in the following months, after we imputing all the contact maps for like pancreas, liver, for all the human tissues, we'll upload our result to the server. That, and then everybody can, everyone can access to the data and every, everyone can calculate the attributions for their, you know, for the regions they are interested in. And so I think uh, that's it. And this is a summary of my this is a summary of the presentation. Uh, I'm sorry, we, I don't have a like a uh, like a manuscript, but it will be available soon today. So the base, I think the most important thing is that I want to uh, introduce the idea that graph convolution networks can combine high C with epigenetic marks, and this is might be the graph representation might be a really great way for jointly analyzing high C with other data sets. And then with our model, the fine scale structures can be accurately predicted by deep learning map. Uh, and the in, then we can impute the content map for like tens of cell lines and tissues. And the predict result can be attributed to different input features, which could help you to analyze the fine scale structures. And I would like to thank my research advisor, Dr. Jie Liu, and our collaborators, Dr. Ryan, Dr. Zhou, and Dr. Zhang, and uh, all the fellow students, Bing Jiang and Yi Zhao, helped me to collect all the data, and uh, Yu Juan helped me to test the baseline models, and Yuan uh, built the web server, and I would, like also, I would also like to thank all the fellow students in my lab. So uh, that's it, and um, uh, now I will answer any questions you have about this research. About the uh, high C plus, that's a really great question. Actually, honestly, I currently I don't know why, but I will check the predictions of high C plus. Okay, so that's it. Okay, so yep. have a great day and okay. Thank you everyone for attending. Be well.